So we're going to launch into the Q&A, which is very short today. So uh, we'll be fairly short and then we'll read from these very, very many wonderful resolutions. At least I hope they're wonderful and you're not abandoning things you should keep and <laughs> preserving and cultivating things you should abandon. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Um, so, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a question that was uh, given to me here, because sometimes in the group people also don't want to ask it directly, uh, so I have a little question on a piece of paper, and uh, yeah, all right, so we'll begin, and uh, for the Zoomies, please do send any questions to, is it to, to Jules today or to Minori, I'm not sure. Minori, okay, to Minori, and she'll pass them on. And uh, yeah, just a reminder to keep them fairly brief and to the point today, so we can get through a few. So the first question is probably quite an extensive one in a sense, but uh, I guess an open question. Why are we cruel to ourselves? <laughs> I've currently noticed my plans to be cruel to myself. And I'd like to understand why. So this is wonderful that you've noticed this because I think we have cruel thoughts, cruel intentions more often than we realise. Perhaps sometimes we only really notice them when they're extreme, maybe because we haven't noticed them building up across the time. And I think one of the reasons for this is obviously that we don't have enough compassion, enough self-compassion. Um, not enough empathy with ourselves, you know, maybe we've not learned to speak to ourselves kindly. I remember this story of a prisoner on death row f there for something he didn't do, which is probably often the case. There's so much racism. I think this was in America as well. And, you know, he was black and sometimes the punishment is way out of proportion with the, the crime if someone has perpetrated something. But in this case, he was innocent. And people asked him, you know, who's there for 20 years? How on earth did you survive that time? You know, and he said, well, I learned to speak kindly to myself. That was how I survived. So one thing we can do when we catch those cruel thoughts or cruel intentions is to, um, to just pause, first of all, and feel the suffering of that and then see if we can allow compassion to arise and try to find some words perhaps inside your mind to articulate that kindness to yourself if you can't actually uh, get into the mood of compassion straight away. So that can be really helpful. You could imagine how it might be if someone were being cruel that way to your friend or to someone you really love and imagine what kind of response you would give. You'd probably say, gosh, you know, you're such a dear person, you're so important to me, you know, I want the very best for you. And, and you wouldn't be cruel to them at all. So you could think about the words you'd say to them if it's hard to find them for yourself and just see if you can gently acknowledge and recognise that you're also a human being who doesn't deserve cruelty, who doesn't deserve to suffer at all. At a slightly uh, perhaps deeper level, which can be helpful meditatively, um, quite often when we want to be cruel to ourselves, I've noticed in me, um, say for example if I'm just staying up too late and I shouldn't be but I'm feeling rotten and I'm doing it anyway it's often because we actually are sort of angry towards the feelings we're having we're angry towards unpleasant Vedana basically and we're being cruel to that you know we're taking it as part of who we are and we're being cruel to it we feel bad so we don't like that and we react by being unkind to those feelings it's a really strange uh, part of the human mind, human psychology, but quite often we're, um, we want to rub it in almost. So I think a practice, an ongoing practice of self-compassion would be very helpful here, and that can begin just by having kind thoughts. It's also um, worth celebrating that you've noticed this, because sometimes these patterns are hidden from us, and when you catch them, then you have a, ch a chance to make a more wise and compassionate choice about how you really want to speak and, and behave towards yourself. Yeah. Okay. I wondered what your comments would be about. Mm. So this person's talking about a peak experience, in their words, um, of getting um, quite still in the meditation mm, very and very still and then it goes from kind of um, um, I love the way you described it, it was kind of a 
basically it's starting to manifest as emotions of love, isn't it? First maybe it's the idea and the feeling and then it becomes the emotion and then it sort of reaches a peak before the thinking comes in. Yeah? Something? And, and yeah, and then also it's almost like this, it's like a feeling of love but mm. it's also a feeling of grief. Yeah, and yeah. And it's almost like the two of Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. Also with the emotion. Yeah, so the love is almost co-joined with the grief and that's when the emotion uh, starts to come. It's very beautiful. I think it's a natural part of a process of uh, learning how to feel that love and learning how to hold it, embrace it and allow it to soften and open the heart. And when our hearts are open, all kinds of emotions get freed up to be felt because you're resourced enough to feel them. So I think it's... Uh, beautiful process that's happening naturally and the way that you're describing it shows you're very present you're really aware of what's happening um, my sense is probably that it's enough for the time being once you've experienced that feeling of openness and kind of a melting in a sense and an emotional kind of a catharsis in a sense it's probably enough for now and that's why something in you stops it subconsciously in a sense but the sense of self comes back in it wants to put words to it it wants to have a little bit more control so I think this is quite natural um, until we get more familiar with those emotions and uh, maybe you know if you're in a, a longer retreat or a quieter space and you had more time you could gradually um, be with that more fully and learn to relax into it a little bit more and then you'd probably start to see these patterns fade a little bit but it's not a problem at all and it's beautiful that you're experiencing that and yeah 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 totally you can cry and I mean again that's why I say if it was a longer retreat if it was quieter if you really had more of a sense of solitude you could have those emotions and just let the tears come it's a beautiful purification process and it's very um freeing for the heart you know you might be letting go of some old pain old hurt and it's like the love wants to fill you up but it just needs to gently yeah allow those other things to to dissolve so thank you for sharing and it's common and uh, often for me too if I have a lot of bliss coming up or love coming up I get kind of teary and uh, that's quite a common experience so this is spiritual um you could call it sadness or you could call it love. It's kind of mixed, as you say, but both of them are not the kind of suffering that lead to more suffering. They're actually a freeing of the heart. So, yeah, thank you for sharing. It's beautiful. Okay, so thank you for asking. And uh, I feel your hesitation and fear. Yeah, that sounds like a really daunting situation. So this person's saying that they have an abusive older sister and um, now they have, I think in the past, is that right? In the past? And you haven't? Yeah. And now they have a family gathering to go to, so she's feeling quite nervous about it and, uh, yeah, quite, quite worried about the whole situation. And, uh, yes, it's not easy. I think you have to be very, very gentle with yourself and, um, um, of course, try to resource yourself as much as you can before you go, but maybe you already have some um, ways that you can remove yourself from the situation if anything happens that makes you feel really unsafe. Um, sometimes, if you're really feeling brave and strong, although this is difficult, it might be possible to say the way that you're speaking right now is, or just the situation right now is making me feel unsafe. I feel unsafe. I'm going to have some time away or, um, you know, I'm feeling tired also, you know, I don't have the capacity for this right now, I'm going to have a little walk, or if you don't feel able to actually say this, I think it's completely um, acceptable to take yourself off to the toilet and sit in there for as long as you wish, and maybe repeat some phases of loving kindness to yourself, you know, put your hand on your heart, give yourself a hug, and reassure yourself that you are safe because a lot of these feelings come up because, you know, it's, it's memories from the past being triggered that cause us to feel unsafe in the moment, whereas actually we're not unsafe. We're not physically unsafe the way we might have been when we were small. So reminding yourself of that can be really helpful as well. And, uh, and maybe having some sort of um, boundary in terms of how long you stay 
you know, you could actually already make up another appointment, you know, make an appointment with someone else. My teacher, Ajahn Ram, sometimes says, oh, I have an appointment, and you ask him a bit more, and he's like, yeah, no, well, the appointment's with myself. Fairly valid. <laughs> you know, so see if you can have something there that gives you a way to, to leave should it become very difficult for you. Really be gentle, because you don't need to be re-traumatized, and yet at the same time, if you can be there and have a few of these um, um, tools in mind, you might find that you gain confidence and strength. That, yeah, you can dip your toe in, but you don't have to stay, you know. But it's not going to um, affect you the way it used to do, because now you are safe. You do have your refuge. You do have your uh, wisdom. And you know it's not about you, right? This is very important. You know, when we're younger, we think everything is about us and there's something wrong with us and this is why it hurts so much. But now, perhaps you'll be able to see her with new eyes and realize this person's suffering. They don't know any other way to be. Sometimes it's ironic, but when we're being abused or when we're receiving kind of angry emails or whatever, the person's actually trying to connect, you know, but they don't know how to do it in a skillful way. So see how, yeah how much compassion can help you and also remember that compassion to yourself. Yeah. If I were you, I would spend some time meditating before you go, maybe practicing loving kindness or compassion towards yourself. Yeah. I hope that gives a little bit of help. But you have permission to leave, okay, any time at all. You don't have to be there. You don't have to stay. Okay. You're very welcome. Anyone else from the Zoom, or I don't see any questions. Unless, uh, Abby, I'm not sure if it's a question. Maybe I'll answer it anyway. Is it a question? Could you just indicate, because I can see your video. Just put your hand up if it is a question for me. Okay. Can I read it from the box? Because it'll be quicker that way. I'm just aware of the time. Okay. So do we have a WhatsApp or online group as part of Sangha Building to address questions in the spiritual journey? Of course, you have Anukampa. So you've seen our leaflets and our programs and uh, every week we have uh, sutta classes unless I'm on retreat or teaching retreat. Uh, but almost every Friday we have that. Um, we have lots of other stuff on there as well. And I'm sure if you look online, there's many, many different things. Um, if you actually want to engage uh, with other people, then you do need to have obviously an interactive group. Um, check out some of the bhikkhuni monasteries online because they do tend to offer quite a lot of uh, this kind of community building stuff simply because we need to have enough support systems in place and it's one of the things that enables the sangha to, well it's essential for the sangha, for the monastic, when I use the word sangha I'm talking about monastics because that's how the Buddha used those terms. Um, he called the fourfold assembly an assembly for different types of people, the lay men, women, monks and nuns, and that of course includes gender non-binary people too, but that was the assembly and the sangha always referred to the monastics. So, but uh, I think maybe go to a few and see what each one provides and where you feel inclined to be and you know, there may be some that are good at one thing and others that are good at something else, so uh, you have to do your research on that, yeah. Okay, um, anything else from the room? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the question is about how to rejoice in the goodness that we do in the virtuous acts of body, speech and mind or whatever we've done for someone else or for ourselves as well, uh, without it going into egotism. And the simple answer is that we're not um, praising ourselves, we're looking at the um, acts. So one of the phrases in the suttas is um, that somebody, a wise person, rests after the day and they lay down on the bed or they slouch on the chair and they think, I've done what is good, I've not done what is bad. Um, I've, made my, I've made a safe refuge for myself. I've done what is good. And then it says that happiness overspreads that person, envelops that person, just like the shadow of a mountain when the sun goes down, the, mount, the shadow envelops and overspreads a person. So just by reflecting on the things you've done that day that you're happy to have done and that give you encouragement and fulfillment, it can actually bring this sense of happiness in the mind. That's the whole idea. So it's not about me being a certain type of person. This is the way, of course, that we think when we have a sense of self. We always think it's about us as some kind of person, but it's just starting to have a bit of insight into cause and effect, into 
the, benef the, the result of actions that are helpful as opposed to the result of actions that are maybe less skillful. So does that make sense? Yeah, that, yeah great. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist. The person's asking about um, mental health issues, for example, BPD, which is borderline personality disorder. Yeah. Um, and I guess other mental health issues and uh, whether they affect the brain or the mind or how that works. And I think a lot of the time, I mean, even research is showing this. I really recommend this book after by a, a medical doctor who talks about his theory and, and quite a common theory now amongst many scientists is that it's the mind that affects the brain. The Buddha said this all along. He said, you know, everything comes from the mind first. The mind is the creator of the whole world. It's the creator of our own reality. And it's being shown that if we use certain um, ways of thinking or ways of behaving, after a while it creates these very strong kind of um, networks in the mind. So you can create networks that are more uh, um, attuned to compassion or you can create other kinds of networks. So it seems to me that in the case of some of these um, so-called personality disorders, which are a little bit tricky because they do seem to have affect the brain, it seems that some of the empathy pathways might be uh, blocked somehow. And it's hard to imagine that's permanent because no person or no matter is permanent. But some of them can be tricky. And I don't know about with borderline. I think sometimes that's not necessarily a lack of empathy, but there are certain... Um, causes for that. So I think rather than looking at the labels, it's good to see the causes and address those. So in that case, it's often to do with trauma, childhood trauma or any other kind of trauma. And in that case, there are abandonment issues which create quite a lot of clinginess and sort of obsession sometimes in relationships and swings from up to down. So, But once we can identify those, I mean, I've read a lot of forums on these things because people do come to me as a bikuni with a lot of mental health illnesses, things they're struggling with, hoping that meditation will help. And to a degree it can, but not to the specific degree of certain conditions which need particular types of help. It's almost as though there's like certain habit patterns we have, which the Buddha would call sankharas, and some are kind of like lines drawn on the water which just disappear almost straight away. Some are like lines drawn on the rock. Some are just kind of generalized, like generalized anxiety or generalized sort of tendencies to anger. Some are very specific. And I think in those cases we can get specialist help. So for borderline, I think this thing called DBT, dialectic behavioral therapy, something like that can be helpful. And um, I guess a lot of um, feeling of security is very key. But uh, I think, you know, as somebody who may be around people with these things, you have to be uh, careful for yourself as well because it can take a lot of energy. You know, if there's one person in a community, for example, with um, whatever, with a mental health condition that just does require a lot more support, it can really take a lot of energy away from the community. It can be beyond the capacity. So I think a support network is important. And if you're part of that network try to understand your only part and and play your part if you can and to the capacity you can but you know make sure there's a, lot, a whole team there to help and also to support the carer as well yeah does that make some sense I mean I'm not a psychologist but um yeah it's tricky I got some questions now from the zoom so <clears throat> I'm unable to place my finger on that which is bothering me, but it's led me to break my precept on eating afternoon, and that is making the problem worse due to guilt. <laughs> yeah. How do I deal with it? I'm unable to sit for meditation as well, as my mind is very agitated. Okay. This sounds like there's a little bit of a guilt complex that's a bit excessive, to be quite honest. I mean, perhaps you are trying to live on eight precepts, but you're not a a bikini, you're not a fully ordained monastic. Even if you are, it's not the end of the world. This is not an ethical precept. There's a difference in the Vinaya, uh, in, the, in the training precepts between those which are monastic conventions, things that support the practice, such as maybe not overeating or eating at the right time if you're depending on arms, and things which are actually ethical issues, such as treating others disrespectfully or um, obviously any kind of physical violence, lies, uh, wrong speech. They're kind of obvious ethical um, 
what do you call it, like uh, mistakes, if you want, um, that the world would consider wrong, right? General society would consider wrong. So when it comes to things like breaking precepts, eating afternoon, it's really not a big problem. So you need to learn forgiveness. <laughs> I mean, maybe you ate afternoon because you were hungry. Maybe, you know, your body needed some food. It's quite possible. Um, so one of the ways to deal with it is to tell a bikini, which you've done. So there we go. And I say, let it go. So, <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, don't worry about it. It might be better to address the, the, the habit patterns of guilt and where they come from than the actual eating itself because uh, sometimes we're so unkind to ourselves. I mean, what would you say to someone else who'd done that? Would you say, oh my goodness, that's terrible. How can you even sit for meditation? You know, <laughs> you're such a terrible person. Of course not. Of course not. So the mind might be agitated for other things too, but often it's a lack of kindness that causes the agitation. A lack of forgiveness to ourselves so yeah be a little kind okay uh, we're actually out of time but I know that uh, the zoomies haven't had much of a chance so uh, would you prefer I just do one really well or three kind of lightly what do you reckon <laughs> okay three lightly do you have any recommended reading material to learn more about the jhanas thank you that's easy mindfulness bliss and beyond all right Please come VC, <laughs> that's me, say a little bit more about the perception of dispassion. Thank you. Yeah, nice one. Um, yeah, well, the word dispassion is one translation. Uh, the word is viraga, and it kind of means, yeah, it, it kind of means dispassion literally, but it also means a kind of fading away. It's the result of just losing interest in things. And so we did talk about it a little bit yesterday, but... It's the uh, result of seeing things as they are. It's a natural result. It's not something we should um, try to cultivate as such because then it could also could almost lead into a sense of aversion um, rather than genuine moving away and allowing things to fade. A lot of the time it comes from the wisdom into seeing the suffering nature of the things we cling to and the fact that they're not really reliable sources of happiness for us and so when we see that we tend to let them go and as a result they fade from our perception they fade away so it's almost like and, and also a way for that to happen is to have a, hap a a better kind of happiness a better source of happiness so for example when you're little you like playing with toys because you're young and that's fun for you at the time but after a while when you grow up a bit and you get into books then the toys are less interesting so you don't sort of say oh these toys are bad I should have dispassion you just grow out of it because you've kind of taken that particular um, interest to its end and you've found that something else now nourishes the mind so I think rather than just letting something go and having less craving for that it's often for me anyway that often comes about through having something else to as a refuge for the mind so when I was in India you know at first I took all my cassette recordings of every favorite Led Zeppelin song and it was really carefully crafted you know that one should follow the next and there'd be enough for all sort of different types of weather and different types of <laughs> season and whatever and uh, after a while when I started meditating I found that meditation actually gave me a, a a different kind of happiness, a more nourishing and um, calming kind of happiness. And I never tried not to listen to, to the music anymore, but it just wasn't as interesting for me. So, yeah, notice uh, the delight in that when things do fade away. All right, <clears throat> this looks like a long one. We'll do my best within a couple of minutes. Uh, I've, been, I've been on sick leave since August due to burnout caused by stress. Being sick brought anxiety at first, but soon after I found it to be the most insightful experience of my life. Yay! <laughs> There's a classic example of suffering to happiness. An insight, even better. I finally have the time to meditate, listen to Dhamma talks and attend retreats. It's thanks to you, thank you, and your guided metta meditations that I finally discovered what it means to have loving kindness for myself. I was missing it all my life. Oh, this is such a lovely one to end on. I wanted to express my gratitude for the service and love that you share. It's helping me transform sickness into a meaningful wake-up call that brought a lot of meaning into my life. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's really beautiful. Very, very nice. Okay, one more. <laughs> I know this sounds trivial. No, it doesn't. Questions are important. But I really miss music when doing retreats. Why is slow music discouraged? Is it okay? Of course it's okay. You're not a monastic. You've not taken precepts. It's just that if you're on a retreat where it's not part and parcel of the um, retreat setup, it's just, na it's just you know, respectful and, and um, yeah, kind of part of what you sign up to, isn't it? Um, but some places, like, okay, so the question continues, is it okay to hear some chanting or to chant? Anything we could find in YouTube, thanks for the retreat. So in some places, like Forest Refuge, which is like always in silence, it's in Massachusetts, and it's like the long course retreat center of the IMS, Insight Meditation Society, they do have a little room where people can go and do some chanting because it does uplift and inspire the mind. It's just that not every place has that. But even if it doesn't, I think, you know, go take yourself off into the woods and do some chanting. Because the Buddha said that when we practice samadhi, we should practice two other things as well. As well as calming the mind, we should do things which gladden the mind and rouse energy. That's called pagaha. And it means kind of rousing the mind, inspiring the mind. Chanting is a great way to do that. And the other thing that we have to do from time to time, especially if we are kind of working with one object, the mind can get tired and dull is to, uh, or yeah, tired mainly. The dullness is, is, the chanting helps with the dullness, but if you're just getting kind of tired and you've been using too much force, then it's good to practice equanimity from time to time, which Ajahn Brahm translates as watching the trees grow, which means basically just relaxing and, uh, and letting things be. So a kind of open awareness, if you like, and just doing nothing in particular. So see if you can... Uh, alternate those different practices and uh, the Buddha said that's like um, you're trying to melt gold and from time to time you want to sprinkle water on the fire to kind of stop it getting too hot and from time to time you want to fan that fire to get the flames going that's like the chanting so do it if it, uh, if it uh, gladdens the mind but obviously don't do it in uh, the middle of a silent room <laughs> yeah so there's nothing wrong with any of these things again that would come in the category of restraint rather than ethically wrong and when you are a monastic or someone who's practicing for, you know, quite seriously over long periods of time, you just find, for me anyway, being very musical, that it just bothers my mind. It loops back again and again. It's worse than thoughts. You know, I just get every song I ever heard, even by accident, going through my mind. And then it's, oh, this is suffering. So it's much nicer not to listen. <laughs> OK, I think we've uh, expired our time for the Q&A. But now it is time for the New Year's resolution. Okay. All right. We'll see how wise you all are. <laughs> and uh, for those on Zoom, you're welcome to pop a few things in the box. So the question was, or the invitation was, um, to... Uh, share one thing that you'd like to relinquish or let go of and one thing you'd like to bring forth into the new year. These can be qualities, these can be habits or behaviours, whatever they may be. And please just keep it very brief, like a couple of words per item if possible. And I'll read a few out, I won't read them all. Okay. All right. So this person says, let go of compulsion to control and cultivate deeper acceptance. <laughs> on Zoom, let go of the deep sadness of grief. I don't know about cultivating, but someone else says, uh, oh yeah, let go of complaining and cultivate contentment. <laughs> yeah, complaining is kind of the opposite, huh? Um, I think this is to let go of irritation. Gone. <laughs> let go of the addiction to food and invite right speech. Awareness of hindrances. I'm committed to recognizing, understanding and embracing my hindrances <coughs> and letting them go. In practice, I will accept the subtle breath, whatever's happening, I will wait and put my faith in the process. You should keep that because that's really great meditation instruction. If anyone wants to reclaim it, 
That's great. It reads a bit like a page on an Ajahn Brahm book. <laughs> Cultivate the courage to be more present, more often, with oneself and others. Cultivate the joy in small things. Let go of anxiety and worry and cultivate more loving kindness. Let go of using the word should. Yeah, but you should let go of using the word should. <laughs> yeah, good. Very good. To cultivate daily loving kindness practice to myself, another and our relationship. Through January 2024. Hopefully for longer than that. <laughs> Lovely. To let go of defensiveness and reactiveness to annoyances and irritations. To let go of rigidity, fear of the unknown. To welcome flow and spontaneity, not getting stuck. To relinquish dwelling on past hurts and bring forth creativity. Wow, I already feel enlightened now. I think that's a lot to work with, isn't it? That'll do for the next few years. Anyway, <laughs> shall I read a few more? What more? More? Mm -hmm. yeah. To cultivate openness, generosity, and kindness to those I find annoying or irritating. That's nice. Start with yourself, go to the loved one, or start with the loved one, go to yourself, and the neutral, and then go to the more difficult person. And that's the way to do it gradually. Uh, let go, okay, or do less <laughs> of phone screening. <laughs> Nourish and find the time to meditate daily at least five to ten minutes. Very good. And don't think that's not enough because when we set the standard at something we can accomplish, it encourages us. And then if you want to do, you can do more. Practice meditation daily if possible. Well, they go together. Let go of resentment at being left out. A deep one. Just come to the zoom again. Cultivate more kindness, patience and discipline. Relinquish my instincts to crave fixed ideas of good and bad. Good, bad, who knows? It's one of Adrian Brown's books. I intend to let go of ill will from the coarse to the subtle by cultivating gentleness and loving kindness. This has lots of red hearts. It's really cute. I intend to extend loving kindness and gentleness from my daily meditations to the thought, speech and action of daily life. And uh, knowing you, you're already doing very well with that. So... That's very beautiful. Uh, let go of being angry and being more kind. Let go of striving for perfection, cultivating I am enough. I aspire to let go of the anger and resentment I have towards my recent autism diagnosis. Yeah, because sometimes these things are very healing. I meant to say that with the question about BPD, that... On these forums, there are many, many people who have been diagnosed say it's such a relief and it's very validating because now they know what they've got to work with. And, uh, you know, these are just completely impersonal things, but at least, you know, you know it's nothing to do with you. It's just a, it's just a particular, uh, what do they call that, neurodiversity, a particular kind of, yeah, diversity of the way the neural process works. I'd like to cultivate acceptance and self-compassion while making life choices that support my autistic brain versus working against it. Beautiful. Oh. And you'll probably be inspiring many others. I will let go, I will let go, this is very good, of attached love and cultivate boundless compassionate love that arises from understanding. Wow. Wow. That's a great affirmation, isn't it, to start the day? You could start the day with that. <laughs> Nurture 
happiness and well-being for my children and grandchildren. Oh. I will try to live in the present and not get indulged. I'm not going to be able to read all of these, so please do excuse me if I've missed any out, but I'm just doing whatever's coming to my screen. To relinquish my instincts to crave fixed ideas of... Oh, I've done that one. Of good and bad. Good, bad, who knows. Uh, confidence in the path to develop. That looks nice, doesn't it? Mm, can you see anything? Oh, I have to put it here. Confidence in the path. Yay! That looks really nice and joyful. One thing to let go of, the attachment I get to tasks that I need to complete in my job and outside my job. I want to be able to complete these tasks with less stress and without holding on so tight. One thing to nourish, myself. Yeah. Especially in the morning, giving myself time to meditate and not rush before work every day. Beautiful. Yeah, it can be five minutes. It makes a huge difference. I think this is to relinquish. Craving. <laughs> if you can relinquish craving, wow, you're on the third stage of enlightenment, so this would be a very good result. Uh, one thing I want to nourish is my love for myself and my brain. My brain is trying its best. I should thank it and cherish it for keeping me safe and alive. Yeah, poor old brain. <laughs> we do abuse our brains, don't we? I do. I abuse my brain. I let go of trying to control my mental disorder. Yeah, your mental... What can we call it instead of a disorder? Your mental... Any good ideas? Difference. Difference, yeah. My mental speciality. <laughs> huh? Concerns. Concerns. Yeah. I've spent many years fighting it and being angry at my brain for just being the way it is. Oh. It's so lovely when we realise these things, huh? Let go of my control and expectation of how life should unfold what my career should look like, or if I'd find a partner. Nourish, spend more time and energy developing my creative practice and be more involved with the Sangha. Very good. We might actually finish all of these, it's great. I wonder if there's any more from Zoom. Let go of anger, learn to look after both my heart, oh sorry, my heart both physically and mentally. Let go of all destructive habits that lead to poor health and negative thinking. Bring in and nourish a daily meditation practice, even just for five minutes on busy days. Yay! <laughs> Let go of Quaker community. Okay. Hello, I hope to Plum Village, Bamford, Bamford? Let go of the Quaker community and hope to go to Plum Village, maybe? Okay, good. Good, bad, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Letting go of complaining and criticizing. Cultivating wise and compassionate speaking and listening. Oh, there's a little heart. I don't know if I want to show the writing because people, well, I don't suppose anyone will identify you, but there's a really cute little picture. See that? It's like got three hearts on the head and a heart coming out of the mouth. It's really cute. <laughs> Instead of a sword coming out of the mouth. <laughs> mm. Let go of the busy mind. A nourish groundedness. Letting go of eating for the wrong reasons. 
and cultivate patience, compassion, equanimity with difficult people and family members. Super duper. <laughs> Open heartedness. And uh, I think there's just another one on Zoom. Bring in a readiness to set a brilliant example to my friends, family and colleagues. <laughs> Excellent, you can be brilliant, I'm quite sure, yes. And when we're not, maybe my thing, my personal thing, is not to have to be too brilliant and to forgive myself when I'm very average or less. <laughs> Practicing more sense restraint. Excellent. Great. That's really beautiful, thank you very much. And uh, if I have missed anything important, Please do type it in now, or anybody else here that would like to say anything else? All good? Are you suitably inspired? <laughs> Full of good intentions. It just feels good even having good intentions, doesn't it? The fact that these things are possible. But I think, you know, my caveat would be, even if you find, you know, you... You're not quite living up to your intentions. At least you have those intentions and that's beautiful in and of itself. So don't give up the intention, even if it doesn't work straight away. Yeah, celebrate the small successes. Okay, so uh, we are going to do the final meta meditation very soon. And we're really on time now, so I'm quite pleased. There's time for a five minute break. And uh, we'll come back and do about half an hour of meditation. And then we'll have a very special blessing for two... Should I say yet? What is for? <laughs> yeah, for two beautiful women here who've come all the way from India. And they're going to go on to Spain to get married. So they want to have a wedding blessing, <laughs> a pre-wedding blessing at the end of today. And they feel very moved by the acceptance and kindness of this community to be witness to that. So uh, it's a very special privilege that we have to, um, to show our support and to be maybe spiritual friends to you both in the absence of your family members being here right now. So um, yeah, we'll be doing that after the final meditation. And uh, I think we'll be, they would actually like to have that recorded so that everyone here and including on Zoom can see it to inspire other people. Um, because yeah, in India, I think it's not possible to get married, is it? So they came all this way via Australia and India to come here to this retreat and then go on to Spain where it is legal. So they want to set that example for other young women or older women. Who, um, who want to celebrate their love and make that commitment. So, <coughs> super duper. So, have your little break, and I'll see you at ten past four.